Okay, well, good afternoon. It looks like we have a few people coming in, so I'll just read through these preambles as we start our meeting and others I'm sure will join. So looks like we have the usual suspects. So hello, good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, your Turlock Subbasin meeting of the two technical advisory committees uh, of the uh, Turlock Subbasin's two GSAs. Um, just a couple quick reminders, um, you know, if you're using Zoom, um, you know, just uh, feel free and uh, mute and unmute accordingly um, as it, the timing comes for um, comment. Um, if you're on the phone, um, you could use star six, that'll toggle you on a mute and unmute, that would be nice, or you could also have um, features on your phone, uh, your smartphone to mute. Um, and um, then if you need to raise your hand on the phone, star nine will take care of that. Also, there's ways to do that in the reactions menu of Zoom. We're all getting pretty familiar with that. So that's pretty good. Um, and we have a public comment section of the agenda where if there's an item not on the agenda, we will, uh, we will receive that public comment. And we also uh, will have sections uh, during the formal agenda where we will have discussion and, and public comment on those items as well. So just reminding you of that. We're recording the meeting um, and um, we have meeting materials that are available on the uh, website. Um, and the one item that's up there today is a presentation that's gonna be given um, by our consultants on projects and management actions. And so that is up there for your reference. All right, Michael, Sarah and company, go right ahead. <coughs> uh, thank, thank you, Herb, for the introduction. I'm Michael Cook uh, from Turlock Irrigation District. I'm the chair of the West Turlock Subbasin Technical Advisory Committee and calling our group to order 202. So far for our group, I have uh, Leandro from Delhi, David from Denaire, Walt from Sanzos County, uh, Mike Pickcock of Waterford and Hickman, uh, Debbie and others from TID, Karen from Ceres, Miguel from Modesto, which is seven members. Have I missed anybody representing the West Turlock Subbasin GSA? If I have if I have those seven, so our meeting is called to order. So um, Sarah, are you available to call your meeting to order on the East Turlock Subbasin GSA? Yes, um, I'm looking through though, and I don't know that we have a quorum, so. Yeah, we, we've got Matt, myself and you, Sarah. Perfect, thanks Walt, I appreciate that. Yeah. So yes, um, we can call the East side to, to um, we're all here, so go ahead. And uh, I said it earlier, but Michael, I'm driving, so as much as you could drive the agenda, that would be helpful. Not a problem, Sarah, and I think there's only one action item for your group today, and we'll take that as quickly as possible. So um, item number three on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. And for the West Turlock Subbasin GSA, we have minutes from June 24th, July 22nd, and August 12th. Those were mailed out earlier this week or sent out earlier this week. Do we have a motion to approve those minutes or amend them Come from anybody? A little motion, Michael. The Landro motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Do we have a second? Second, Waterford. Okay, Mike, Mike from Waterford, second. So we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of June 24th, July 22nd, and August 12th. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We have any opposed? Okay, so those, those minutes stand approved unanimously. So over to you, Sarah, for the East Sherlock GSA minutes. Okay, for East Sherlock, we have minutes from July 22nd and August 12th. So I would look for a motion to approve those two minutes, six minutes. Ms. Walt, I make that motion for approval. Thank you, Walt. In a second. I will second. This is Matt. Thanks, Matt. So I'll do a roll call vote. Um, Matt? Yes. Walt? Yes. And yes from Sarah. So and sure. Lacey with Merced County is here as well. Oh, yes. great. Thanks, Lacey. Uh, and how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. So our motion's passed. Uh, wonderful. So that finishes up action on item number three minutes. We move on to item number four, public participation. 
This is the time set aside for members of the public to directly address the Joint Technical Advisory Committee on any item of interest to the public that's within our subject matter jurisdiction. Um, you can raise any issue now, but if it's an item on the agenda, for instance, like project management actions, you can raise your uh, issues then, your thoughts then. So with that, public participation, do you have anybody wishing to address the Technical Advisory Committee? Okay, hearing nobody, and I see no hands raised, we'll uh, close public participation and move on to budget. Uh, update from Michael Clipper, Treasurer of the West Sherlock Subbasin GSA. Uh, Michael, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the West Turlock um, Subbasin, um, for July 31st, we had a balance of $129,200 and $88 and 32 cents. Um, and then that, uh, and then you see the bank account there. Um, and then moving on to the next page, um, it kind of reflects. So we haven't received any uh, dues yet. Sorry, let me rephrase that. For the month of July, we didn't receive any dues. In the month of August, we've received um, several members pay their dues along with their basin contributions. So you can kind of see the activity uh, so far from July, to, from beginning of July to the end of July. Then moving on to, uh, so that's any questions on the um, West Turlock Subbasin. Then, then moving on to the basin account, um, at the end of July, we had 900, and $9,711.43. You can see the expenses for July and the payments we made. Um, moving down to the second page, or the next page, uh, here's the year-to-date activity, which is mainly the activity for July. Um, again, my men as I mentioned, um, we re we've received um, payments in August, um, nothing is reflected in July. Um, any questions? No, no questions for Mr. Flipper. Uh, one other note, I will um, present the Basin account at the meeting on Monday. Wonderful, so. thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Michael. So there is a uh, Monday at five o'clock, there's a joint meeting of the West Sherlock and East Sherlock GSA boards. And um, at that point, Michael will do an update of the overall uh, basin account. So with that, uh, Sarah or anybody from the East side, is there an overview of the East Sherlock sub-basin groundwater budget? Um, yeah, this is Sarah. I'm sure I can go over it quickly. Um, I believe our 218 that was just um, voted on past um, earlier in the month. And um, we, if in your packet, you will see our um, invoices to date and our monthly budget tracking, but currently cash on hand, we have $298,651.21. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah? Okay, hearing none, moving on to item number six, projects and management actions. This is a review of the preliminary list of projects and management actions and preliminary modeling results. Um, the idea is for uh, Wooden and Curran to give the whole group an overview of what they've been working on and then get input on those projects and management actions as quickly as possible so they can complete the modeling of those um, projects and management actions and then tie that into the plan and the um, sustainable yield analysis. So with that, Ali, I will hand it over to you. Or is it Dominic? Um, I will be starting, uh, Michael, and then um, we're gonna be tag teaming between myself and Dominic on this. Sounds good, Ali, welcome. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here again. And uh, we are going to be discussing the projects and management actions. Uh, which is part and parcel of the development of the Turlock Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Um, if you can go to the next uh, item, please. 
so agenda for this particular presentation is going to be discussing uh, and, and reviewing the existing projects uh, that have been shortlisted for analysis uh, for the uh, GSP. Uh, and we're going to go through some of those and then uh, we'll have some explanation of how the scenarios have been broken down and then specifically focus on the first scenario that has been developed and analyzed on a preliminary basis. You'll see what the assumptions are on, on that particular project and scenario and what the results uh, on a preliminary basis look like. I would like to share those with you and get some feedback on the level of detail and also how this particular scenario has uh, <clears throat> has been developed and uh, analyzed so we can use the same learning from today's conversation in assessing the remaining scenarios we will also have a brief discussion on management actions and then next steps on uh, on the gsp uh, sort of uh, uh, analysis and gsp development so next slide So the regulations, uh, these are quotations from the regs, uh, call for uh, a G, uh, the GSAs who are developing the uh, groundwater sustainability plan to develop each, each plan shall include a description of projects and management actions that the groundwater sustainability agency, the GSA has determined uh, to, to achieve the sustainability goal of the basin, including projects and management actions to respond to changing conditions in the basin. Uh, furthermore, uh, the GSP is also requiring that a list of projects and management actions that are proposed uh, uh, to be proposed in a plan with a description of the measurable objectives that is expected to benefit from the project or the management action. And we'll talk about that as an example with the scenario that we've, uh, we've analyzed to date. The list shall include projects and management actions that may be utilized to meet interim milestones and uh, the exceedance of the minimum threshold or where undesirable results have occurred or are imminent. So as an example, we've looked at the uh, uh, baseline conditions as we presented the baseline uh, conditions to you folks in the past. The, the overdraft continues to, uh, to uh, happen in the basin and is projected to continue happening. The overdraft that is happening is as a result of uh, um, pumping that is groundwater pumping that is in excess of the, of the recharge into the basin and inflows into the basin. And, and, and the baseline condition also projects that the overdraft conditions would cause undesirable results with respect to wells, uh, groundwater levels, groundwater storage, with respect to the interconnected surface water conditions. And so at least three of the six items on the GSP uh, sort of uh, uh, sustainability indicators are checkboxed as being significant and unreasonable under the baseline condition. And that is why we're going after uh, coming up with what sort of projects need to be implemented in order to help us on meeting the sustainability uh, condition and goals in the basin. Next slide, please. So we've split up and divided the projects that we've assessed and looked at so far into three groups, three categories, oftentimes used interchangeably. The first one is uh, management actions and, uh, and, and projects that are ongoing. And, and we'll look at one of those in just a minute, specifically the Stanislaus Regional Water Supply Project is a project that is under construction imminently going to be in place. All the plans and projects and designs and everything has been in place. And so we're assuming that that is a group one that is going to be definitely implemented in, in due time in a couple of years. And so we're, we're including that as part of the analysis of the benefits of that project in, the, uh, in, in sustain, meeting the sustainability goals. Group number two or category number two are projects and management actions that are readily implementable uh, with minimum 
uh, additional infrastructure uh, infrastructure or facilities and and those could be put in place as long as uh, proper you know institutional uh, arrangements and agreements and contractual agreements are in place and as, as as long as we can also secure the funding for these projects they could be put in place and those are also group of the projects that i'm going to review in just a minute with you folks and we're going to be analyzing the benefits of implementation of these projects uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of three weeks uh, the third group of projects or categories of the projects are those which we call supplemental projects or management actions. Those are kind of uh, future projects uh, at mostly conceptual level. The details of either uh, the size of these projects, the yield of the projects, the source of water to the projects, uh, sometimes even the location of the projects are not quite known. As such, we are going to be using a list uh, of these projects in the GSP as potential future projects, but they're not going to be analyzed at this stage for the purposes of the sustainability of the basin. Next slide. So we're going to review, um, um, I think it, there's like 10 projects or so that we're going to review in, in uh, over, over the next few slides in here. Overall, we developed a list of 25 projects initially of which one ended up to be in group one, category one, and nine of them ended up to be in group two, which we're gonna be analyzing. The group one project is the uh, Regional Surface Water Supply Project, Stanislaus Regional so um, Project. The cities of Turlock and uh, Ceres are proponents to the project along with TID as the major source of the water. The project is a surface supply uh, project for in lieu of groundwater use. It's expected to have a yield of 30,000 acre feet phased over time. And that's going to be discussed as soon as uh, Dominic gets on and start talking about the actual scenario. We're going to have a whole lot more detail on that. But the project is under design, as you all know, and it's going to be imminently implemented. And so we're going to be analyzing that. The next project is the uh, water supply project to the cities of Waterford and Hickman. Uh, and it's going to be a surface water pump station and storage tank that would uh, benefit both the Waterford and Hickman area in bringing in surface water uh, to these towns uh, through, city of, through coordination and correspondence and collaboration with city of Modesto and Modesto Irrigation District. Uh, the project has gone far enough to be able to show the capacity of the project, and we're going to be analyzing that as part of the scenario that, that's going to be presented to you folks today, as far as what the benefits of this project is to the basin. Next project is uh, a storm basin uh, project, which is uh, called Diane Storm Basin. It's in the city of Sherlock. City of Sherlock and TID are collaborating on, on this project. The um, project is supposed to be a recharge project during winter time, mostly capturing storm water as well as excess water from TID canals that would be put into this, pro this, this particular uh, uh, storm drain uh, pond for, for recharge. And again, that's part of the scenario that's gonna be presented today as well. The next project is another one which is also considered to be an urban uh, project. Uh, it's, it's promoted by Stanislaus County and it is on the uh, uh, Stan State uh, um, campus. And it is a recharge project upwards of about 460 acre feet a year that's expected to be captured and uh, through storm, storm water and, and recharged to the groundwater system. Uh, this other one, uh, from here on, we're going to be talking about the ag, mm, mm, pr predominantly ag uh, pr uh, projects. And so this one here is an on-farm recharge project that TID is promoting. The source of water is TID and the beneficiary lands are within the TID service area. 
Uh, it's expected to have a yield of approximately 4,000 acre feet, uh, upwards of about 8,000 acre feet in wet years and above normal years. Uh, the way this is going to work is uh, the uh, Don Pedro is, is, is um, many times is going to have excess water during uh, winter times. And so that excess water is going to be diverted into certain lands uh, and, and certain ag fields for recharge during winter time. Uh, the GRAT team are on board to help both the east side and the west side to identify fields that are suitable for recharge and the crop, uh, the, the ag areas that are suitable also for being inundated uh, with extended duration of time by, by flood water that would also benefit the groundwater system uh, in, 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 uh, in a groundwater recharge sort of uh, context. Next one. Uh, this one here is uh, recycled water that the city of Sherlock is uh, going to be providing to TID uh, in, in exchange and as part of the agreement between TID and City of Turlock for the, uh, as part of the Stanislaus Regional Water Supply Project, there's going to be 2,000 acre feet of uh, recycled water that would be provided to TID, which would be supplied to certain lands within TID as part of the overall water supply of TID to their, to the parcels in lieu of groundwater. So there's going to be approximately that same amount of groundwater reduction, reduction in groundwater pumping that's going to take place in, in the lands that would receive this 2,000 acre feet a year. Next one. Uh, this one is uh, the series uh, main regulating reservoir by TID. Uh, it is intended to have approximately uh, 575 acre feet a year of reduction in groundwater pumping uh, by, by managing about 10,000 acre feet a year of estimated spillage uh, that would be reduced in average uh, and dry years or on the average during dry years, I would say. And uh, the, the uh, spillage would be held in the Don Pedro for TID future use. This one here is uh, a very similar project to what TID uh, has conceptualized and is gonna be implementing, which is also ag land recharge. But this one here is going to be uh, on the east side. Uh, the source of water is through Highline Canal and uh, is, is going to be excess TID water. But uh, historically, these same lands have received approximately 2000 acre feet a year it's projected that upwards of about 4,000 acre feet during wet years and above normal years could potentially be available to these lands, depending on the infrastructure and on the agreements between the uh, East Side Water District and TID, uh, that, that volume of water could potentially be- The presentation last night, um, John is texting me about that. Yeah, he's giving an email. Oh, he's just- but we, We've hey, never- uh, Someone needs to mute. Uh, what happened? We haven't posted uh, office hour presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this one here is another project that Eastside Water District and Eastside uh, GSA is pursuing. It's a direct groundwater recharge project that is focused on the uh, flood control of the uh, flood control conditions uh, in, in the Mustang Creek. And so it's, it's intended to capture additional flood water from Mustang Creek, uh, which, would, uh, which would recharge the groundwater system to the tune of about 2,500 acre feet a year. Next slide. And, and this one, I believe it's the last project that is on the East Side Water District and East Side GSA list. It's the Upland and Waterford Pipeline that is intended to uh, bring in uh, direct and in lieu water for recharge to uh, the uh, uh, to this to these areas here. And there is an agreement in place between East Side Water District and Merced ID that identifies uh, 1,770 acre feet a year of water that would be available to these fields here. 
in conversations with uh, MID and Merced ID. Well, when I say MID, in this case here is Merced ID. Uh, the, the, there could potentially be uh, additional water available depending on the uh, uh, operations of the McClure Lake and also uh, other commitments that Merced ID may have. Uh, hydrology allows for potentially additional water that could be put into these fields here and in, into these lands for, for recharge or in lieu recharge, I should say. So, so there's additional potential water that could put, uh, be available as well. Next slide. All right, so, so, so the 10 slides that we just presented cover the one through 10 projects in here today. Um, we have gone ahead and sorted out these projects by the respective grouping or category, uh, but also we've gone ahead and put these into scenarios for evaluation using the integrated hydrologic model that's been developed. Uh, the number 11 is what's called the demand reduction, and so that's kind of uh, the catch-all for uh, any additional uh, what any additional reduction in pumping that needs to take place to bring the basin into sustainable conditions. So today we're going to be talking about scenario number one, which is basically the urban projects that's on the list, projects number one through four. And so Dominic is going to go, be talking through that and showing you the results of the analysis for that project. We're going to be uh, utilizing this urban component of the project across the board for all the scenarios, but then scenario two is going to focus on the ag projects that are promoted by the West uh, Turlock uh, GSA, and scenario three is going to focus on the projects, ag projects that are promoted by the East Turlock project or East Turlock GSA, and then scenario four will combine everything and look at the cumulative effect and cumulative benefits for all of the ag and the urban projects. With, between scenario four and scenario five, uh, between scenario four and the sustainability condition, we will most likely have some gaps. I, I'm not looking at the crystal ball, but I would imagine that there may be some gap in order to meet the sustainability of the basin. And then so in order to find what that gap is and what the, uh, what the uh, sort of size of that gap is, we're going to be performing one last scenario, scenario five, to identify the additional pumping reduction that needs to take place to bring this, uh, the, the basin into sustainable condition. So with that in mind, I'd like to pass it on to Dominic, but I want to make sure that if there are any questions, to address questions before we move on. Yes, I do. Are you able to hear me, Ollie? Yes, I am. Yes, uh, this is Milt with City of Turlock. Uh, I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. With all the projects that you've just uh, outlined, we're going to possibly over time capture 30,000 acre feet of water yearly. Is that correct? A total of 30,000 acre feet per year over time. Uh, the 30,000 acre feet being? You started out by saying that we're going to capture 30,000 acre feet over time. So all the projects you just outlined, because there were certain levels, some of them were, you know, 22.5 uh, acre feet, 900 acre feet. They all total up to 30,000 acre feet over time. Is that, do I understand that correctly? So, so the projects would each individually have certain yield, depending on the source of water, the timing, and many of these projects are, are poised to be happening only during wet years or above normal years. And so we're going to be adding up what the total yield of the project is, but also what is going to be the potential benefits in terms of the actual water that would be captured within the groundwater system and how much of the uh, overdraft we're going to be reducing. And if I may add to that, the 30,000 acre feet a year that Ali mentioned earlier is uh, predominantly going to be focused on um, the maximum capacity for the surface water supply to the series of Turlock and series. Um, and I'll go and as far as what the kind of cumulative look of all like of several of our projects are going to be, I'll be going over that in the next couple of slides. 
Yes, because I realized that this year we're actually reducing or overdrafting the subbasin by 100,000 acre feet. So we're only capturing one third of what we're overdrafting this year. It's going to take a long time. Actually, it's not going to be possible realistically. But anyway, we've got to do the best we can. I'll listen. Thank you. Yes. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay, Dominic, you're on. Okay, thank you. Whoops. So the, the next couple of slides, I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of go through the quantification of at least some of the projects that Ali spoke to related to the urban and municipal water supply. Um, effectively, the first five or so projects that Ali mentioned are really related to both uh, bringing additional surface water supply to our some of our municipalities, as well as supplying additional groundwater recharge uh, directly through recharge basins in uh, particularly predominantly in the city of Turlock. And so uh, effectively scenario one of our modeling effort is to look at what are the impacts of these? Take uh, a look at the you know the quantification on on an average basis over the 50-year hydrologic period uh, that our baseline is based off of. We see we can compare that to uh, get an idea of really what are the, what are the impacts on, on both on a water use perspective, but then ultimately get a look at what does this mean for the aquifer system and how does how does this system react to uh, some some of the some of the changes that we're promoting here. So I know Ali went through all the uh, all the kind of a list of all the projects, but I wanted to kind of go over again some of the ones that are really just focused in on this specific uh, scenario, being the being focused on the kind of the urban some of the urban projects and management actions that we have, and really kind of give you an idea as to really how they're being simulated in the model, um, as opposed to kind of the direct kind of the big overview of our projects that Ali gave a few minutes ago. So the first project that I wanted, want to go over is the SRWA project, which is bringing uh, up to that 30,000 acre feet a year of surface water to the city of Turlock and Ceres. Now, this is predominantly going to be water supplied by Turlock Irrigation District, and, I, and it is up to 30,000 so that this volume of water will be uh, both. It will have a kind of a temporal ramp up period as we uh, uh, build the treatment plant and kind of get all the necessary infrastructure in place. But in addition to that, it will be limited by uh, TID's uh, general uh, surface water delivery. So if it is a drier year and there are uh, some restric restrictions or reductions in TID's surface water supply, uh, this volume of water would be affected to it as well. So when it gets into kind of the quantification as far as what is the model experiencing here, um, I've broken down kind of the transition or implementation of this project into kind of these four Four main categories, and you can see here that um, there's we do have a general ramp up period. Now, if kind of to give everybody kind of a quick reminder of how uh, the, both the baseline and our scenarios set up, this is based on a 50-year hydrologic period beginning in 2016. Now, effectively, since this project is not uh, operational yet. We're, what we really have is the first seven years, um, th this project does not exist, at which point in 2023, it kind of gets, um, the project comes online, the treatment plant comes online, and we will start able to providing surface water to each of these cities to offset some of their groundwater production. In addition to just the water being supplied from TID to the cities and the kind of the municipal use from there, uh, a part of the agreement of this project is that the cities will provide a degree of offset water to TID in dry and critical years. So effectively, uh, whereas TID gives predominantly um, surface water in some of the drier years when TID has its general natural um, reductions in, to its agricultural users based on the local hydrology, uh, the cities will su supplement some of that water um, to re and return that kind of the, to the agricultural system here as part of that agreement. Now, um, kind of jumping ahead a, a little bit that to give you an idea of just the kind of the magnitude of those offset waters, I think we're looking at an average uh, over kind of a long term average um, of about 2200 acre feet a year. So um, just to kind of get put that into a little bit perspective. Now, also from the modeling pers uh, modeling side of things in order to really simulate uh, what are the impacts of this project to the basin as a whole, uh, we do need to make sure that we capture some of the effects on the Tuolumne River and, and really focusing in our stream depletions, our surface groundwater interaction um, as 
as part of Sigma, it's important to really capture these impacts. And so one of the other components that we have is that since this surface water project diverts water uh, on a new diversion point off the Tuolumne River near the city of Ceres, we will be having uh, the Lagrange Dam uh, spilling additional water into the Tuolumne River to account for the additional uh, diverted water here. So the Tuolumne River will have a kind of a different amount of water available in it. In addition to that, we also have a couple other projects, um, a little bit smaller in magnitude, but for the next one as far as bringing a surface water supply to the basin is this Waterford and Hickman uh, water supply project. Now, granted this is being supplied, the, wa the water at least originates as part of Modesto Irrigation District's uh, water supply. Uh, it, it is going to utilize the Modesto water treatment plant, the city of Modesto water treatment plant, and will be providing water to both sides, both in the Modesto uh, subbasin for Waterford and in the Turlock subbasin for Hickman. So we'll have a little bit of additional surface water, about 900 acre feet, again, limited to uh, general surface water uh, availability, and but a, a maximum annual uh, contribution of 900 acre feet a year. And this goal of this, similar to the previous, is to, to reduce the overall municipal pumping in the area. In addition to the surface water supply projects, we uh, in the city of Turlock, we're going to have two recharge basins, uh, one for, uh, in uh, at the Diane Storm Basin and one at the Stanislaus State Recharge Facility. And so the combination of these is, is approximately just under 500 acre feet a year um, with the bulk of it being at Stanislaus State. Now I do wanted to mention that this scenario will be incorporating two additional projects that are outside of our basin, uh, being that the modeling effort is, is simulating both the Turlock and the Modesto subbasins. Uh, we wanna make sure that we capture some of the projects that the Modesto subbasin is implementing as well. And so uh, this way, and this is predominantly to be because we are uh, a, a, alike to Modesto subbasin, there's a lot of subsurface flow interbasin coordination that needs to be taken into account as part of Sigma. In addition to that, the, the, these projects will be affecting Tuolumne River flows. And since stream depletions are a major component of Sigma, uh, we need to make sure that we simulate these um, to really give us the best impact that we can. So what we are simulating for the city of Modesto is the city of Modesto has proposed a conservation effort to uh, reduce their per person water use. So this is the gallons per person per day. Uh, we're gonna reduce that by about 50 uh, 50 GPCD on average over this 50 year period. In addition to that, similar to some of the city of Turlock's recharge basins, the city of Modesto is also putting additional recharge facilities into the city to uh, encourage up to about 248 or 250 acre feet a year of additional recharge into the basin. So uh, getting into some of the modeling results, really what is the impact of this? Well, the first thing to take a look at is to look at our, what, what, we're, what we call our land and water use budget. Now, the all, kind of we accumulate all the projects that I just listed here. Uh, overall, we can kind of see the impacts to both the, the water supply, the water demand, um, and kind of really see how that water is being used. And so uh, uh, if we kind of go, go down this list, really we can see that overall, Overall, we're expecting urban demand to be reduced about 2,000 acre feet a year. Now, this is going to be predominantly in a little bit of, this, of the city of Modesto that is within the Turlock subbasin and is going to be uh, indicative of their conservation efforts that they've been um, implementing recently. So we see about 2,000 acre feet from that. In addition to that, we have the urban surface water on average is supplying 18,000 acre feet a year of, of surface water to uh, all three of those, all three of those communities, Turlock, Ceres, and a little bit, um, to a lesser degree, uh, Hickman as well. And so, uh, and again, I want to, you know, kind of this is where I make the caveat where of, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's the up to thirty thousand acre feet a year, um, but and the, and this really captures that ramp up too. So this isn't just kind of the project at full build that, but over that full fifty year, uh, fifty year hydrologic period, we see an average of eighteen thousand acre feet. Now, the, off, the combination of these two, including re of reduced demand and additional supply, allows us to reduce the overall urban pumping in the basin by about 20,000 acre feet, at least as particularly for its urban use. Now, in addition, I did mention when it comes to the SRWA project, there is a, a degree of offset pumping. This is municipal wells 
municipal pumping that is then supplied to agricultural use uh, during dry and critical years as part of the SRWA project. And as I mentioned earlier, that is about 2,200 acre feet a year. So kind of overall, what we're gonna see uh, as these projects are implemented, uh, is kind of the summary I have here over here on the right, is we're gonna have reduced urban demand in the city of Modesto, increased surface water supply to Turlock Series, Waterford and Hickman. And that the culmination of those two means we have reduced pumping in all five of these communities. So what does that mean for our aquifer system? So as I mentioned a second ago, we have about 18,000 acre feet less pumping uh, in, the, in this scenario as comparatively to our baseline. Overall, uh, where does that water go? That's kind of the, the question here, right? We look at the, some of the subsurface flows, some of the, the hydrogen, hydrodynamic uh, situations between and simulation between the stream and the aquifer system, look at the impacts to our water levels. And really, what does that mean as far as looking at the overall water budget over this 50 year period? Well, of that 18,000, 7,000 of it is, or so is, is going to be reduced stream seepage. Now, this is really going to go directly to uh, assisting the basin in meeting its sustainability goals as far as stream depletions. In addition to that, we'll also have about 6,000 acre feet less subsurface flow. So currently, we, the comparatively to the adjoining basins, we have a net inflow into the Turlock subbasin. And this, uh, a lot of these projects, some of that, that reduced pumping is going to help alleviate some of that subsurface flow that is occurring uh, between Turlock and its adjoining sub basin. In addition to that, we also have 3,000 acre feet of, of, in, of imp, increased storage in, in the aquifer system, and that's going to be on an annual, an annual basis. So right now, if we take a look at this kind of this water budget here, and I really just want to focus on this cumulative change in storage chart. If I want to go to the next slide here, we can see that that cumulative change in storage, which is really focusing in on this 3,000 acre feet a year on average, but what does that mean over a long period? So as I mentioned earlier, we have about a 50-year hydrologic period that, that our sigma is based on, right, that our sustainability goals are really focused on. And what we can see here is, is two things. One, I would like to kind of point out is that the bulk of the uh, municipal impact is going to be seen in the SRWA project. And as I mentioned earlier, that SRWA project doesn't come online for the first seven years of the model, which means that from that this from this beginning period to, to seven years into, into our scenario, there's not gonna be a significant change. We'll still have the recharge basins, we'll still, uh, but the bulk of it is going to be uh, delayed until the, the treatment plant comes online, which is why we really see don't see a lot of difference between this uh, the scenario, which is in this green line and the baseline, which is in this kind of darker blue color. But once that treatment plant, comes online, we start being able to supply additional surface water to the cities, reduce our groundwater pumping to a higher degree. We'll start beginning to see uh, that impact take into account. So we can see really that overall, particularly over this long-term period, we can see a good degree of, of increased storage in the basin. As it's over a 50 year period and we're looking at about 3,000 acre feet a year, you're looking at a 50 year impact of about 150,000 acre feet over the full hydrologic period. Okay, so what does that mean as far as groundwater levels? Now, if I kind of a quick reminder to everybody, are uh, whereas the water budget is a great tool to help us quantify a lot of the impacts to our basin and the impacts of these projects and put numbers to that, a lot of the, the uh, sigma is going to be based on meeting our minimum thresholds, and so it's really important to be able to gauge some of the the groundwater levels to that. Particularly, uh, you know, there are other other components, but we are using uh, groundwater levels to give us a, a, a to utilize as a proxy for both storage, stream aquifer interaction, and we also need to look at our groundwater levels um, to get an idea of to specifically to looking at the uh, minimum threshold or the sustainability criteria of depleting groundwater levels. So to get an idea of what these, what we mean as, and what are the impacts to these projects uh, at kind of uh, specialized locations, I've, I've printed out at least a couple uh, hydrographs for us that we can get a look at, see how much of an impact as far as water level goes are we seeing. So kind of to uh, familiarize anybody with these figures, uh, first of all, we're gonna have two figures per slide. Now we have a, a what I have the blue here on the left and a purple, uh, figure on here on the right. Now these are going to be the spatial location of these two hydrographs. If you look up here on the top right hand corner, we'll see a blue dot and a purple dot. Uh, this is effectively gives you an idea of kind of where these hydrographs are located. In addition to that, uh, since we are comparing the scenario that I'm running and the impacts of these projects to a baseline, I wanted to make sure we incorporate both of those in each of these charts. That way we can kind of see the relative difference and the impact that we're making rather than just looking at the absolute value. And so what we'll see here is that there's the, in the first half or sorry, the first third or so of the pro of this hydrograph is what we're looking at is the historical period. 
And then from there, this beginning in 2015, we're going to see a, a kind of a diversion of what was the scenario and then the baseline as well. So the, the variance between these two is really going to be what's the impact to them of some of these projects. So we want to take a look, kind of a dive into some of these projects. The first two uh, figures that I have here on this slide are going to be really focused in on some of the northern impacts uh, of our basin. So this is going to be really focusing on what are the impacts around the city of Ceres, uh, predominantly focused in on the SRWA project, and what are some of the impacts near these um, over here to the city of Waterford and Hickman. One of the impacts over there. So really, at least initially, what we can we see if, if we take a look at the kind of the blue dot in the city of Ceres, near the city of Ceres, we can see a, an approximate, uh, a kind of a gradual increase in the water levels over time comparatively to the baseline. But in addition to that, we see somewhere about approximately about a five to six, uh, sorry, four to six foot uh, variation between the two. So we're, we're basically, the, the, these projects have helped us increase our water levels by on average about the, that four to six feet. Uh, over the course of the simulation period. Now, when we want to look at what are the impacts near and a little bit further to the east, as we look at the water supply project related for Waterford and Hickman, we can also see that very similarly, we do see an increase in water levels. Now, on the other hand, the project is not near the size, there's nothing near the amount of pumping in, in Hickman as there is in Turlock and Ceres. And so we are going to see a lesser impact overall as far as a per foot impact um, that we see in this hydrograph. So in this one, you can see here, there's a lesser, probably a two to three foot increase uh, in our water levels. Now, the next couple uh, figures that I have here are kind of being basically going to be moving southward, um, really kind of focusing on this particular slide, kind of what's in some of the water levels between Turlock and Ceres, and then being the other main uh, provider of some of these changes in some of these project management projects and management actions uh, is I'm going to take a couple wells from around the city of Turlock and see if we can get an idea of really what are the impacts from the SRA and the recharge projects that we have there. Hey, Dominic. Uh, Mike Titsa's got his hands up. He's got a question. Thank you. Uh, Mike, did you have a question? Yes, very quickly. Um, I understood the say there was going to be more water relief from the river. Uh, we, have hard time. we have a hard time hearing you, Mike. From the river. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll type my, my question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're having a hard time hearing. If you, if you can type it out, um, I can add my chat and I will uh, address your question since I see it pop up. Okay. Uh, so while he's getting an opportunity to, to type that, uh, type his question into chat, um, I'm gonna kind of I'll just continue this slide and then I'll hop back over when I see that pop up. Um, so as we effectively move a little bit further south, we're gonna see a kind of a continuation of the same impacts we saw in series. We'll see increases in what increases in our overall water levels, particularly the further we go out and the further these projects are online, uh, particularly here, you kind of see some of the wet years comparatively to the dry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the, the SRWA projects are really focused on that up to 30,000 acre feet, but in our periods of drought, when TID has general drought restrictions and, and reductions in its surface water availability, that's when you're gonna see kind of in general, you'll see water levels moving down due to the hydrology. But in addition to that, you'll see kind of the lines coming a little bit closer together. And that's gonna be just because we're related to the fact that there's going to be less uh, water being operated in these projects, at least comparatively to some of these wetter periods here, we're going to see the variance is, is kind of growing to five plus feet um, uh, resulting from the, from the implementation of these projects. And we kind of see the same thing here with this purple dot here. We can kind of see that Overall, particularly in the latter half of these implementation, we're going to see um, an increase in water levels of, of five to seven feet. So now kind of continuing to, to focus a little bit in uh, around the city of Turlock, we can see again, the same kind of very similar uh, reaction to the projects that we do from the, to the previous. Uh, but again, as we get closer to the city of Turlock, uh, where a lot of this pumping is occurring or the reduction of a lot of this pumping is occurring, uh, the additional surface water supply, that the variance here between the two simulations, um, the impacts that we're seeing to the aquifer system is going to continue to grow. And, and this is exactly what we'd expect. The closer you are to a project, uh, whether that's surface water supply or a Dish or reduced groundwater pumping, we will see higher uh, variance between the projects and the scenario. 
So then again, moving a little bit further east, again, it's kind of the very same story. The first several years, we don't see a lot of change. And then as we continued on, you'll see uh, continued growth in the variance between the two models. In this case, uh, we're similar to the previous. Again, we're closer to the city, the city itself. And so we're see that, that variance jumping, not necessarily that five feet, but we're looking at 10, uh, sometimes 12, 13 feet of, of variance overall. And as we get further away from the from the cities and number of the projects, I've, I actually just kind of grabbed two wells out here um, in the east side because there there are not the urban projects and there are the municipalities. So really, as we kind of get further away from the impacts of these projects, as you would kind of expect, the impact is going to be lesser and lesser. Now there is going to be an impact because there is not a, a direct boundary in the aquifer system. But what we will see overall is that impact overall is going to be very small. And this is just related to the proximity of, of the projects itself. So you can see here that if I kind of grab two wells in the east, the, imp the difference between the scenario one and baseline is about a half a foot in here on this blue one and you're looking at by about a f um, between a half and about a foot between here on the in the purple. So that's all I have as far as modeling results for scenario one. Um, I haven't seen Mike's que uh, question pop up. Uh, if he if I don't know if he sent it to somebody else, then um, please let me if someone can let me know. Um, but while I effectively Dominic. While we, yeah, yes, sir. I do have a question. Uh, this is again Milt with City of Turlock. Um, I'm a Turlock citizen. I should say a Turlock citizen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dominic, okay, would you clarify something for me? I understand that this year we're overdrafting the aquifer by 100,000 acre feet. Is that true or is that not true? That's my question. So I cannot, I don't, I cannot speak to this specific year's overdraft. Um, I'm not sure what kind of the source of that uh, estimate. It, could you mind elaborating a little bit? I've heard that because we have 30 million acre feet in the combined subbasin aquifers, mm -hmm. and we've downdrafted that by one and a half million acre feet. And I understand that these last two years, so that would probably include last year because that was also a dry year. We we, do, we lowered the, or we used an additional 100,000 acre feet of water. Uh, whereas in the normal year, we're using about 30, normal wet year, we're using about 30,000 acre feet of water overdraft. But in a dry year, like last year and this year, we're using a total of 100,000 acre feet per year. So we're on this downward spiral at this point, and who knows what this year, or I mean, next year will produce. So my question again is, is it true that we're down, we're exceeding the, we're lowering the aquifer an additional 100,000 acre feet per year in a year like this year? So let me, ter let me try to take a stab at this, Dominic. And, and, and so <clears throat> the, the actual volume of how much we've extracted and, and how much overdraft we've had over the past couple of years uh, we, we don't have that data. Um, we haven't made that estimate uh, particularly, but the groundwater level information that's been distributed and published by DWR and other entities show that groundwater uh, is, uh, levels have been going down. So that's that we're in agreement with you on that. But to what extent we can quantify that, we haven't really gone that far, honestly, to be seeing what's happening. The fact that we're going through a drought, the fact that the reservoir, the surface reservoir conditions are, are not looking good and they're kind of gloomy uh, is, is definitely something that's not, not deniable. And, and, and so, uh, yes, the, 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 there is a downward trend overall. Thank you, Ollie. That answers my question. Thank you very much, Ollie. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for what Dominic presented on quantification of the benefits and or impacts of uh, the urban side of the uh, project? I see that Mike's question has come through. Oh, it yep. did. Okay. Yep. So, so for everybody who doesn't have their chat open, uh, Mike asked us, can you please elaborate on why seepage from stream decrease when flows in the Tuolumne River need to increase to maintain flows after the project is implemented? So I think we actually have kind of a, a 
a separation kind of, of, of two ideas here. So if I kind of go back to some of our, some of the uh, water budget here. Uh, so the first component is why we have why is it is our goal to have reduce the generalized stream seepage? Now, this is going to be predominantly focused in on at that part of our sigma, sigma regulatory requirements require us to not induce uh, additional undesirable stream depletions. So overall, what we have through kind of the, some of the discussions with both both GSAs and some of the other operators of the Merced and the Tuolumne River, it, um, predominantly going to that is going to be TID and Merced ID, is that the that our our pumping and our use of the aquifer system has induced additional stream seepage to the point that it impacts their surface water operations. So as part of the Sigma, we're trying to minimize the amount of, of pulling additional stream seepage from the river such that we do not negatively impact their, their overall um, surface water operations and, their, their, and so that they can meet their regulatory requirements as far as surface water operations. This now that I would like to kind of separate to the second half of this, which is uh, when flows in the Tuolumne River need to increase to maintain flows after the project is implemented. Now, the goal of this, of uh, looking at the impacts of this, isn't to be able to facilitate uh, the additional surface water supply required to provide water to, to each of the municipalities, but rather the it's really more of the effect that TID surface water operations will be purposely spilling the 30,000 or the up to 30,000 uh, additional acre feet such that the cities can meet, um, can, can divert that water to be able to utilize the project itself, but to also, but, and, but in addition to that, we also need to make sure that we meet our regulatory requirements as far as downstream flow, environmental flows impacts on the Tuolumne River itself. So we basically need to be able to uh, both supply water, but we also need to meet our generalized regulatory requirements. Hopefully, uh, Mike, hopefully that answered your question. I don't know if you have a follow up, but yeah, we can we can we can discuss that probably offline um, a little bit more. But overall, also, Michael, um, as a result of this uh, reduction in groundwater pumping due to this project, groundwater levels are also higher, and then so as a result, we expect to have less seepage from the river uh, in in certain reaches. We have not diced and sliced all of where that's all happening, but we would be more than happy to do that if that's where we need, if that is the level of detail that we need to analyze each one of these projects. At this stage here, this was like a preliminary first cut as to what the benefits of a project of this magnitude with this geographic area would, would have on the basin. So uh, let's move on. Um, I'm not sure how much more time we have, Michael, uh, but... Uh, you are the main event today, Ali, so you take what time you need. Okay, thank you. Good um, questions today. So, I mean, I think we're getting some good questions and that's, that's always good. So if we can maximize participation, it takes more time, that's, that's fine with us. All right, that sounds good. So why don't we continue pausing and see if there are any other questions on what's been presented so far. Is, is the level of detail that's, uh, that's, that's presented today uh, uh, sufficient enough for you folks to, to have a reasonable idea of what the benefits of the projects are, you know, in terms of what the magnitude and volume of the benefits are, as well as location of the benefits, so to speak. Are there additional charts and maps and type of figures that you folks would like to see or more detail that, that someone would like to see any of the GSAs or participants? I think all of the information you've shown has been extremely helpful. It makes me feel a lot more optimistic to be able to visually see the impacts. Um, so thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you, Karen. Other thoughts? Having none, maybe we could go to the management actions and we can always come back to any slides that you may have questions on. So let's keep going, Dominic. So with respect to the management actions, this is uh, very similar to the slide that I had earlier uh, 
from coding from the regs in terms of the projects and management actions. I just wanted to underline the, the fact that there are certain management actions that need to also be listed and potentially taken by the respective GSAs to help bring the basin into balance and bring it into sustainable condition. And so I'm not gonna repeat the regs again, but uh, management actions are, next slide please, are, you know, we, we've, we've split the management actions, so to speak, into two categories. And uh, folks uh, have, have really brainstormed on this over the last two weeks now. And uh, we've come up with idea of having management actions defined as plans and programs that would help to bring the basin into sustainability. And, and I'll give you an example of that, but a clear example of that is an, as an example conservation measures, some, uh, you know, actions that would directly help bring the basin into sustainability and help reduce groundwater pumping, as opposed to implementation actions that are other actions that would, uh, uh, would, would bring tools, information, data, and analysis that would enable us take those management actions. As an example, you know, we need to develop a data manage, database management system. We need to refine our monitoring program. We need to continue taking water level and water quality measurements and uh, analyze them and, and so on and so forth. So those would be implementation actions that need to take place. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and, and we need to do, but they do not necessarily directly um, uh, uh, help on the sustainability, but they would help us uh, assess uh, the sustainability of the basin in terms of implementing the management actions. So go to the next slide, please. So here are the list of what uh, the group have, has, has thought about in terms of the sort of management actions that are currently on the list. The first one is development of uh, an implementation of conjunctive use strategies. Uh, conjunctive use strategies are strategies to combine the use of uh, surface water and groundwater resources together and uh, get folks off groundwater or reduce groundwater pumping during wet years by using, uh, by using surface water to the extent that is available. And, and then rely on groundwater during dry years. And, and of course, that's going to be a function of how much surface water you have available, where you have that surface water available and, and under one context and so on. So it's going to be somewhat of a challenge in certain areas to bring uh, strategies for conjunctive use into play, but we're definitely gonna be talking about that uh, in the GSP and uh, we're going to be looking at potential opportunities that they that may exist and if not at least we have that on the on on the books for you know, future opportunities that may arise well permits and well spacing and metering requirements these are all uh, management actions that would go, would go a long way in terms of actually managing uh, a, how much water is being extracted and pumped from the groundwater system, and B, to the extent that the groundwater uh, is being pumped from specific wells and so on and so forth, uh, how can we uh, space out future wells in a way that would minimize the impacts uh, and interferences from one well or the other uh, to the other, and also uh, um, allow for better use of the groundwater system and groundwater facilities. Well permits are something that uh, other neighboring basins have looked at. And so uh, the restrictions and or regulations that should go uh, uh, in, uh, and, and be put in place in order to uh, permit uh, additional wells or drilling deeper wells, those all need to be looked at and evaluated and rules and regs need to be developed to uh, minimize the uh, extraction from the groundwater system. The third one is development of pumping rules for Western lower principal aquifer. Uh, the 
uh, as, as you folks all aware, are aware, there's Corcoran Clay uh, um, that is encompassing uh, quite a large portion of the western part of the uh, of the subbasin, and and so uh, the lower part of the aquifer system below Corcoran is called the lower principal aquifer. The the aquifer above that is called above uh, upper principal aquifer system, and then so. Anytime that we pump, uh, in addition to uh, what the potential metric surface uh, of the of the lower aquifer system allows, and and we exceed that, we are uh, causing potential for land subsidence. And and so the thought on this number three is to make sure that we come up with rules and uh, uh, and guidelines as to how much water can actually be developed and pumped from the lower aquifer system in order to minimize the opportunities for land subsidence and threats of land subsidence, I should say. And, and that is happening on, uh, you know, that needs to take place on both the east side and the west side, even though Corcoran clay does not necessarily exist on the, on, on the east side, but uh, any additional uh, subsurface flows from the west to the east may cause additional flows in the uh, lower principal aquifers also to go from west to the east and so additional threats on land subsidence as well. Number four is to develop and implement demand reduction strategies and conservation practices by each one of the GSAs. We've already gone through a demand reduction scenario in the past. We've presented that to you folks. Uh, most of the demand reduction strategy that was conceptualized at the time is in the areas that are uh, using less or not, no, no surface water for that matter. And so uh, there needs to be additional conservation measures and specifics on the, on the strategies on how to reduce demand uh, on the groundwater system, uh, that that all needs to be put in place. Some of that could be in the form of land following. Some of that in, it could be in the form of increasing irrigation efficiencies and uh, what what it takes to basically reduce the draw on the groundwater system to to meet the sustainability goals of the basin. Number five focuses on the actions. Uh, uh, action plans uh, that 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 needs to take place by each one of the respective GSAs in the in the event that min minimum thresholds are exceeded, and these minimum thresholds, at least from uh, groundwater flow standpoint, have been focused on groundwater levels, groundwater storage, and also inter uh, interconnected surface water. And then so we've already talked about minimum thresholds and measurable objectives for each one of these three, in addition to land subsidence and water quality. But the first three that I named are specifically related to the uh, volume and the quantity of the groundwater system. And so what sort of actions need to take place uh, and, and how long do we need to wait before we have uh, uh, any um, sort of action taken as we uh, violate and we exceed minimum thresholds. Uh, do we need to reduce pumping right away? Uh, do we need to have, uh, um, uh, you know, some sort of a support on the domestic well owners who may be impacted as a result of violating the minimum thresholds? Uh, are there, do there need, are, are there needs to be uh, some sort of funding mechanism in place to support the uh, domestic well owners who are impacted by that or the ag residential well owners and and so on and so forth so there there may be a host of actions that need to take place uh, you know when when minimum thresholds are exceeded and violated that then needs to be discussed and put in place so when that takes place you know the uh, you know in a drought year like this uh, there are actions that are already been uh, decided and adopted to to be put in place And then last but not least are policies uh, for adaptive management, uh, like any other water supply project, groundwater system and surface water system in the Turlock Subbasin is not an exception to that. 
And so the, the point in here is to start thinking about what are some of the adaptive management actions in the event that uh, we run into situations like we are this year and last year. Um, and in the event that the climate change conditions um, start uh, you know, going south and, and, and get worse, and there's rest, less rainfall and less uh, stream flow. And so what sort of adaptive management actions do we need to put in place in the event that uh, the sustainability goals are not met? Any thoughts on, before I go to the implementation actions, I'd like to see if there are any thoughts, conversations and uh, questions on, on these uh, management actions so far. Any questions for Ali on the management actions? Um, yes, this is Milt uh, again, Turlock Citizen. Ali, uh, you just stated in the last point that you're going to have to implement climate change a, a climate change scenario as things uh, progress in our environment. So will that be in writing or is that just going to be something that's, or will that be in writing? I mean, will that agreement or that plan be in writing as to what will happen if we have to make additional changes because of additional climate change uh, conditions? Uh, let me step back and, and make sure that we're all on the same page. So the regulations call for assessment of the sustainability condition uh, of the basin under climate change, under a climate change scenario. We have already analyzed the baseline conditions that, that we showed you. Uh, also under one climate change scenario, which is the 2070 uh, central tendency, what's called the central tendency conditions. And so, of course, the, uh, the, the, the uh, future projections become worse as, as they stand. And so we need to take more uh, extreme actions in order to, uh, to make sure that the basin stays within sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable goals. And, and so to that end, uh, there, there needs to be some, again, like on, under number six here, some adaptive management techniques and or strategies that the group need to think about and agree on to implement in order to make sure that in the event that over the next 10, 15, 20 years, climate change starts getting more uh, exacerbated and, and, uh, and, and rainfall conditions uh, become, uh, become scarce and we are impacted more under climate change then what sort of actions need to be put in place? I, I think that's what I'm trying to say. So I, I want to make sure that I'm not stretching the, the uh, what's been discussed so far beyond what's been discussed. And, and so I'd leave it to maybe some of the managers if they have other thoughts on this. So it's kind of, this is Milt again, so I'm going, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, please. <laughs> I'm just saying, so it's kind of, it's not really in writing at this point, it will have to be done at the time that it's necessary to do it. Is that what I'm understanding? So I'm not sure what you mean by in writing. I mean, all of this is going to be put in place before, uh, before the end of the year uh, in order to make sure that there are some uh, strategies that are in place and the GSAs have already thought through what, how to implement those strategies, whether or not they become part of a legal agreement or not, uh, that, is to, that is to be decided. But at the same time, the GSP is going to a plan that both GSAs uh, need to uh, in, uh, uh, adopt and commit to for implementation. So to that extent, discussions are still, you know, uh, going on in order to make sure that these strategies are, are, are reasonable and they are implementable from all around all, all the different, uh, by all the different parties. Okay, thank you, Ollie. 
Oh, it is Kevin. Uh, maybe maybe I could help uh, Milt out a little bit. I, I I think you just want to see it in writing in the GSP. Is that correct, Milt? Absolutely. Yes, uh, that is correct, Kevin. I mean, some kind of yeah scenario, a plan. But I mean, I've missed a couple meetings. No, I've missed a couple of the meetings, so I don't know if that was previously discussed. So I don't want to you know, get too deeply into it. I, I, Ollie basically answered my question. So I think. Okay. Just... Okay. Well, it, it okay. will be in writing though. Don't, don't, not. To okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Kevin. You bet. Any other thoughts, questions? I see a question um, on the chat in here. Is the GSA, is by Amanda, uh, is the GSA considering a drinking water mitigation program to assist when low income family uh, wells go dry from water levels declining to the minimum thresholds? Uh, that would be, Amanda, um, most likely one of the items to be discussed in terms of coming up with strategies on their um, uh, on their uh, item number five there so when when the uh, groundwater uh, conditions uh, violate and exceed the minimum thresholds there needs to be actions taken with respect to how to mitigate uh, and address drinking water conditions for, um, you know, underrepresented or low-income families. Uh, that that would that would need to be addressed in there as well. Okay, thanks, Ali. I think um, we haven't done an analysis, and I haven't seen a similar analysis come out from um, from the Turlock GSAs, but. It's been the case in other um, GSP areas that even before the minimum threshold is reached, folks' wells are going dry. Um, and that's, uh, well, one that needs to be taken into account when shaping the minimum thresholds, you know, how many wells are going to go dry. But um, you know, in order to protect drinking water, especially for those folks who aren't able to control the pumping around them, um, there really needs to be some sort of support for for helping folks deep in their deep in their wells when they go dry, even if it's a not quite reached the minimum threshold. So we're wondering if um, we would prefer that action to you know, to be in place before the minimum threshold is exceeded. Right. So um, so the minimum thresholds um, consider. Uh, the domestic wells, um, they have been set throughout the basin to be, they have been set uh, throughout the basin to be at the 2015 groundwater levels. And then so to that extent, other than areas uh, in the in the vicinity of the Merced River, which is said to be at 2014 levels, which are actually higher than 2015 levels, in most of the other areas in, within the basin, it's said to be at the 2015 groundwater levels. And to that extent, it is assumed that the domestic wells are reasonably protected if we stay above uh, 2015 groundwater levels. So, so um, um, uh, I believe my colleagues at, at Top Groundwater did some analysis on that. I'm not quite up to speed on that. I, I, don't, I don't think Phyllis is on the call today, but we can definitely come back with more detail on that, Amanda, in the next. Yes. Okay, thanks, Ali. That, that would help um, folks that we work with in Delhi to know that their wells will be protected if they, they're able to see that sort of analysis and know that if the water levels stay above the, the 2015 levels, that they'll be okay and that action will be taken if the minimum threshold is exceeded. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, seeing no other questions and uh, none here, maybe we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah, I don't know, but Mike Tietze had his hand up earlier. Mike, you, did your question get answered already or are you gonna save it for later? I, I don't have any other questions, I'm, I'm fine. I can cover anything else later. 
Perfect. Thank you. All right, Mike. Thank you. All right, let's move on. Oh, this is it. Okay, so this one is implementation actions. And remember, these are not direct actions with respect to uh, sustainability uh, criteria, but these are actions that need to be uh, put in place to make sure that there are tools, data, information that are available uh, for to, to make sure that uh, management actions and the projects are properly implemented. And so to that end, Number one is definitely improving monitoring network and addressing any data gaps. There are significant data gaps here and there and data gaps are never ever gonna go away. But to the extent that we could address them, to the extent that we could minimize them, to the extent that we could uh, review uh, all of that. Uh, uh, review, review the data gaps in order to make sure that we have comfort level with, with the type of information that we're dealing with, we're gonna have to have uh, certain actions uh, on, on that ground. Number two is identification of lands that are favor favorable for recharge. Uh, certain areas um, in the uh, upper watersheds and or in, in, in uh, even within the basin, there are lands that are favorable for recharge from both uh, slope and or soil conditions. And so the uh, the idea is to make sure that there's a process in place to identify these lands and to the extent that those could be uh, somewhat uh, identified and uh, tagged for future recharge uh, conditions, uh, that is the goal there. Uh, development of a database management system, all of the information that's been put together to date uh, within the context of the GSP are all e e either in the context of the integrated model or in spreadsheets, uh, various spreadsheets, relatively organized spreadsheets, but they're still in spreadsheets. The accessibility of this information to the uh, entities and agencies are somewhat limited. The sharing of the information in the, in the context of a spreadsheet is difficult and not easily manageable. Uh, also making these available publicly on websites are also time consuming and uh, not as uh, sort of technically efficient uh, in the context of 21st, uh, 21st century technology. So the idea is to develop a full blown web based DMS database management system to make life easier for those who are managing and maintaining data sets, but also making them available to public and other uh, users, but also make the reporting much more streamlined to the DWR when time comes for updating the GSP and or for uh, reporting uh, the GSP implementation for during the annual updates. Uh, identification of lands. Uh, I thought we talked about this. Uh, why is it showing up twice? My apologies. I don't know why that's showing up twice. Uh, we'll go to number five. For some reason there's a hiccup in my spreadsheet here, so my apologies. I'll, I'll make that correction. Uh, number five is development of guidelines to control shallow groundwater through operation of drainage wells. Uh, the drainage wells uh, on the TID side in within TID have been used uh, for for management of the uh, of the groundwater system and the shallow groundwater, but also they've been used for water supply purposes. And so the idea is to develop guidelines to ensure that the, the shallow groundwater is properly managed. Number six is drought and climate change planning. Maybe this will get to what Mill was also, also talking about. We need to have uh, 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 more assessment on, on what the drought conditions and the climate change, uh, future climate change conditions, more of an extreme uh, conditions would, would uh, include and what would be the uh, guidelines for us to start putting policies in place for when uh, those kind of conditions are occurring. Number seven, supporting sustainable groundwater supplies to the underrepresented communities. Amanda, I think this also touches on your question as well. So there needs to be some policies and plans to be put in place as well for ensuring that the underrepresented communities and low-income communities who are relying on domestic wells are reasonably uh, protected. 
And last but not least, to make sure that there's outreach program and strategies in place to make sure that uh, all the GSP implementation and follow-ups are all happening in a reasonably open and transparent environment for everyone to chime in and everyone to be aware of the implementation strategies of the GSAs. That's all I have to share with you folks. If there are any questions, thoughts on this or any other parts of the presentation, please feel free. We'll talk about the next steps in a minute. <coughs> Ali, this is Debbie. Debbie, please. Uh, I think number two was supposed to be conducting a survey and identifying um, active wells and including that information into a data management system. Oh, thank you so much, Debbie, for clarifying that. So that is additional data collection and, uh, and a survey of the wells that would be helpful to also plug into the DMS. Thank you, Debbie, for clarification. Any questions for Ali and Dominic? Thanks for the presentation, guys. You mentioned you could talk about next steps, Ali, up to this? Yes, Michael. So if you go to the next slide, please, Dominic. So next uh, steps are gonna be basically uh, finalizing the projects assessments. Um, we, you know, I, I didn't quite hear any uh, alarming concerns about that scenario one, but we'll continue refining it as, as additional information may become available, but we'll also plug scenario one into assessment of the, few, uh, the other scenarios as well. And uh, we'll be focusing on scenarios two through uh, four and uh, go through that motion and uh, bring the information back to you folks. Um, complete me, completing the management actions, like I talked about, the list of management actions are there. We are brainstorming and working through detailing all of that out in a form that would be all in written uh, form uh, uh, to be shared with you folks before it makes it to the groundwater sustainability plan document itself. And we're also at the same time working on documenting the, uh, the integrated model that's been developed for this um, project and for the GSP. And so uh, as soon as we have that completed, that is also going to be shared and to solicit comments from you folks. But at the end of the day, that's all going to make it into an appendix in the GSP document itself. So that's, that's what's upcoming for us. There's a question in the chat. Uh, so there's a question by Mike Titz. Uh, do you envision the implementation actions? Uh, do you envision that the implementation actions will include investigation and modeling to refine water budget uncertainties? Um, uh, that could very well be the case, Mike. Uh, to, to look at the uncertainties in the model, that would be part of the data gap, I would say, an information gap. So uh, we've already talked about having the, uh, any data and information gap that is gone into the model to also be part of that data gap uh, assessment. And so that's where it belongs. And we, we will be looking at that. And I'm more than happy to hear your ideas and thoughts on, on that as well as you evaluate the model results to date or the model documents as it becomes available. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's all we have, Michael, uh, unless if there's no other questions, back to you. Thank you, Ali. So it looks like you were off to, um, based on the conversation, they run another, well, finish up the management actions and run the model and see what that brings us in terms of sustainable yield. That's correct. Yes. Sounds like a plan. Okay, moving, that finishes up item number six, project management actions. Moving on to item number seven, uh, Sigma related updates, just general updates from various members of the group. And uh, no actions taken on these. Our first one is our communication and outreach subcommittee. Herb, is that you? Herb, you're on mute in case you're trying to talk. Say what? So Herb's not available right now, apparently. So 
schedule, Debbie, is that you? We'll skip to that one. Sure, um, I can I can talk about both the grant and the schedule. I usually kind of lump them together if that's okay. Um, so uh, Ali talked a lot about where we are with um, with the projects and management actions. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other components of the plan that we're working on. Um, and and uh, with the idea that that we have lots of things coming in parallel or you know moving through the process to kind of merge together on in in um, the the GSP um, towards the end of the year. Um, so uh, we do have three chapters that are currently available for comment. Um, I believe we have received one comment very recently. I haven't had a chance to look at it, and um, and we will do that. Um, the water budget section has been reviewed by the TAC and uh, gone back to the technical team. And we have a revised draft that is scheduled to go to the, the GSA boards for their consideration and review and um, consider releasing it um, uh, uh, to the public on, on Monday. So you should be seeing a, a draft or, or a, an agenda for that special meeting, a joint GSA meeting um, on Monday the 30th. You'll see that coming out shortly. And it'll be posted on the website and um, it'll be via Zoom um, similar to, to this. Um, so, so be looking for that. Um, uh, also, uh, the Technical Advisory Committee has reviewed an initial draft of the Sustainable Management Criteria section. And those comments have gone back to the technical team and uh, the technical team is, is uh, reviewing those and, and working on updates to that section. Um, uh, we anticipate seeing a draft of the monitoring network section. You've seen reports from the technical team, but you haven't seen um, uh, language yet for the monitoring network section of the plan. That is expected to be out um, for the TAC to review at um, the beginning of, of this next month. And so uh, please schedule some time accordingly because we're gonna have a very quick review period. We're trying to get these reviewed and comments back to the technical team quickly. So then we can make any revisions needed and, um, and then bring it to the public for, for their ability to comment. So, so we're gonna have a, a quick turnaround. So please, please make yourself available next week, um, at least for the TAC to the TAC team to, to review the comments um, and get those back. Um, that's, that's the majority of, of the current updates um, uh, on where we are. Um, we're gonna keep plugging along and, and working through it. And if there are any questions um, as, as we move through that, please don't hesitate to, um, to ask. So I'll, I'll stop there. And if you have any questions, let me know. So just let the group know next Monday is a joint meeting of the West Sherlock and East Sherlock uh, Sustainability Agency boards, uh, where they'll be uh, taking action on releasing chapter four. Chapter four, the water budget. Sorry, I, I guess I probably wasn't clear on that. I apologize. Yeah, so water budget, right? So it'll be released, well, they'll take action on that Monday and released for, for public review. And then next Thursday at noon, we have our ongoing series of uh, lunch hour talks, just kind of casual drop-ins for the public to uh, get on Zoom and ask uh, people involved in this technical advisory group any questions about the um, about Sigma and the GSP in our region. The main focus of the topic will be the chapters that were released uh, a month or so ago, uh, one, two, and four, I think it was, regarding background and um, kind of settings for the basin, so that uh, technical stuff. So we'll have staff available Monday, uh, sorry, Thursday from 12 to 1, maybe a little bit later, depending on the number of questions, to any questions that anybody has about Sigma. So I know Herb is promoting that as best he can. Okay. Any other items? Michael, I'm back. Um, back? Yeah. Um, uh, right. Thanks for, you did, a, you, you and Debbie did yeoman's work on some of the things that are interconnected, but I just have a couple items real quick. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here and just mention something that we haven't talked about in a bit, but um, this is uh, the Turlock Subbasin Bill Insert that we created a while back and sent a high resolution file around to the GSA members. 
Um, and this is just something to point out. We have uh, two sides. It's identical information, but front, front is English, back is Spanish. Um, and so that is available for member agencies uh, to put in their offices, to send out in bills if they can um, and do that. So I just wanted to make that note. Um, that's one thing that's it's out there. Uh, it's on the resources page of our website as well uh, for people that just want to take a look. It has some of the same information that's in our fact sheet. So I just wanted to mention that. Also, um, I mentioned this last week, but I'm pro I'll probably mention it every week that to those member agencies that are presenting to their councils or their boards, um, please let us know and we'll document that in our GSP outreach that's going to be in chapter three of the uh, notice and communication section of the GSP. Um, on that note, we are continuing to work on chapter three um, and we are, getting, we are getting close to an administrative draft uh, to, to be coming out, I would say in the next, in the next month or so at the latest. Um, so look for that and we'll get wor that working around the TAC for comments. Um, uh, Michael already mentioned chapters one, two, and four of the GSP are out. Um, uh, and those are available for comment. You can visit those at, you can visit turlockgroundwater.org slash GSP on our website, and you could find ways to comment and you could download those for you if you haven't had a chance to comment on them yet. Uh, we've been asking for comments on those by September 1st, if at all possible, that would be helpful for the team. And then lastly, um, Michael mentioned uh, September 2nd, we have our next groundwater lunch hour. We will be covering chapters one, two, and four at, at a, a, a high level and having questions and comments um, taken on that as well. And for posterity, I will say um, you may have seen, we have this flyer circulating around um, and for people to pre-register um, uh, so that they could um, do more than just be in listen only mode. Um, and the link is there on the flyer, which is available on the front page of our site and on our um, workshops page too. And so that's my brief update and happy to answer questions or move on to the next item. Hey Herb, any questions for Herb? Okay, hearing none, our next special meeting of the Joint Technical Advisory Committees is scheduled for Thursday, September 9th. And we have a regular meeting scheduled for September 23rd. So getting close to the end here, we're kind of gathering momentum and um, trying to get that finalized GSP together for adoption early next year. So with that, I'll take a motion for adjournment of the West Turlock Subbasin Technical Advisory Committee. I'll so make motion. a motion from Denaire. Okay, so David from Denaire made the motion, second by Curtis. Curtis, second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, West Turlock, we're adjourned. East Turlock. Hi, this is Lacey. Is there a motion to adjourn from an East Turlock member? Yeah, adjourn. And a second? Yep. I'll okay. second. Matt, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.